Welcome to Blockchain All-Stars. I'm your host, Layla Gulen. Blockchain and distributed ledger technology are at the forefront of the Internet 3.0 era, where the technology can enable trusted and transparent sharing of data and digital assets. Although the technology is still in its early stage, who makes up the constellation of innovators guiding us through the digital revolution powered by blockchain? Well, as the famous quote goes, when bankers get together, they talk about art. When artists get together, they talk about money. Well, Oscar Wilde was certainly wise, and so is our guest. Amrita Seti is an award-winning golden visa holder and the first NFT artist in the Middle East. After a successful career spanning 15 plus years in some of the world's largest multinational financial companies, Amrita left the corporate world for a deeper calling, which led to the creation of a new multimedia art form called Soundbite. And Soundbite merges sound, technology, and storytelling with NFTs, giving Amrita a perfect platform to showcase her dynamic art form. And with so much more to learn, Amrita, I want to thank you so much to uh, join us on Blockchain All Star. Wow, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, first, what does being a golden visa holder mean? So I've actually lived in the UAE for the last um, 14 years and Dubai is, is a, a beautiful place to live and a very all-inclusive uh, place where they want to welcome people from all around the world. And they also want to welcome people from top talents in their industries. So what the UAE has issued is golden visas to people who are experts in their fields that allows them to stay for 10 years um, within the UAE without having to renew their visa. And so I was very honored and lucky to receive this, uh, you know, very prestigious honor from the UAE Dubai Art and Culture uh, for my contribution to the digital art market in the UAE. So it's um, it's something of a, of a of definitely an honor and allows me to call the UAE my home and allows me to continue to express myself as an artist here. Goodness, that's a, a members only club of maybe a 0.00001% of the world's population. <laughs> that's quite the honor. Absolutely. And, and for me, it's also just really being one, you know, one of the first NFT artists in the UAE is also um, something that I, I wear proudly as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, Soundbite is a unique idea that garnered a lot of attention from Forbes, CNN, BBC World News to winning awards and being selected for Expo 2020. So uh, what I'm just curious if you can tell us a little bit more about Soundbite, uh, what it does, how you came up with this idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, as you, you rightly said, I used to be, you know, sort of a banker turned artist. And while I was in my, you know, in that transition phase um, between, I actually was working for a lot of the world's largest corporates. Um, and I originally wanted to go and do my own thing from, um, you know, just from an entrepreneurial, but it's still in the financial world. Um, and in that time, you know, I don't know, but I had this obviously passion for art when I was younger. And I think sometimes that as we get older, we kind of sometimes lose our passions behind or we feel, you know, life takes over or we feel that that was just a dream that, you know, it was nice while we had it. But I just connected to myself um, in that, you know, that time between taking some time off. And that's where I literally, I always say I discovered my voice, right? So I, I, I what I do with sound bites is I say a word or a phrase or a person's name, like I can say your name. So we can say Layla and then capture the shape and structure of the sound wave. And then each of the lines of the sound wave, I draw to match the meaning of the word. Yes. So there's been things like sound wave art, where you literally see just the lines of the sound wave, but this kind of combination of imagery with also the sound waves, with also storytelling is I think where then when I created it, I was like, I don't think anybody has done this before. So I, you know, I went to go copywriter just to make sure I wasn't copying anybody, to be honest, um, because I thought on one hand, it was a pretty obvious idea, but then nobody had done it. Um, and so that's how I discovered my own art genre. So, so you kind of just see behind me, if you look there, there's this one actually says the phrase, what the NFT, which I actually created 
um, you know, back in back around this time last year, when NFTs really kind of took um, a, a massive, um, you know, that's when it kind of exploded into the market when Beeple's work sold for 69 million, then everybody was like, all of a sudden, like, what is what is an NFT? And like, so it's like capturing, I think, the incredibility of like what the NFT, because there were so many, and I still think there are still so many questions around how can just a JPEG be something of so much value? Mm -hmm. Why is, why has, how can it be art if I can't touch it, if I can't feel it? And so what I do in this piece, especially for example, behind me is that, you know, it tells the story of where NFTs have come from. So looking at things like CryptoPunks and, you know, things like, um, you know, the, the Beeple sale and, you know, aspects of the history of it, but also trying to kind of tell a new story and tell a new narrative. Um, because I think, you know, what NFTs are providing is a real shift in, um, you know, in our mindset. And it's a paradigm shift, not just for the art industry. Art is the first thing that has, but was able to capture people's attention. But NFTs are really here to stay and change the way we work fundamentally across all assets, um, across all digital information, from everything from art even to media. Mm -hmm. And the uh, subject matter of your art. So when you take a word or someone's name and you turn it into an image, uh, is there a certain subject matter that's associated usually that you tend to lean towards or is it just whatever that word or name speaks to you well i mean it's a very good question and i think with for example like for example if i said your name right and in fact um you know this is something that i've already done quite a bit of but now i'm going to be going into the realm of with celebrities where i you know you say your name and you tell me your story you tell mm. me your narrative and so it all comes comes down to you know like where were you born what what you know where did you come from what do you do what you know what defines you so it's like a modern day portrait telling but also in a really dynamic way. So like if we think about the Mona Lisa, you know, what you would they would have to do is take a portrait of uh, the Mona Lisa and try to capture the essence and vibrancy of that, that subject. But I've used now technology, art, sound, um, and storytelling to tell a very dynamic story. And even for example, if I did one for you, you could even tell a story a year later. So you would even have like, you know, every year and, you know, you could have a different story, but even if I asked your friends and family about you, maybe they write, might write another story. So the whole premise of my artwork or what sound bites are kind of based on is you've heard of the phrase, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Uh, yes. But what I do is I flip it on its head and I say a word is worth a thousand pictures. So whether it's your name, whether it's the city of Dubai, you know, whether it's what the NFT, you know, it's people's, a lot of different images will come up. And so that's what I try to capture. But I also, um, when I do uh, do my art, I, I kind of now start to use it as a way to write new narratives and new stories, right? So um, for example, I've done a piece as well called Africa Blockchain. And with that, obviously, I captured the word Africa and use the Africa Blockchain. But I wanted to, you know, instead of creating these kind of black and white and dreary images of starvation and whatever, you know, and, you know, like a country in need or continent in need of always help. I've created a colorful one where, you know, the future of blockchain is actually leapfrogging it into, you know, really what you could even overcome certain other developed markets now. So it's about what are we, what are the stories we tell ourselves? What are the narratives we see? And how can I also change that imagery to create, you know, new ways for people to see things, if that makes sense? So it absolutely does. It's like a collision of a portrait and a biography all, all in one piece. I just love that. It is such a profound thought. Uh, you have set live activations and installations across the Middle East, Asia, Europe. Uh, so this must be something so new for people to to see to experience so what has been the reception uh not just from 
astute art collectors and people who are in that world, but just people walking down the street who may not collect art, but are just spellbound by what you do. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, because I come from, I call it from the, you know, the traditional world or the normal world, and I've transitioned to the digital, um, you know, people who are in the digital world, our family there, that, you know, that they've understood, they've accessed that different dimension. And but what I believe is that we have to take everybody on that journey, right? But you can't overwhelm people, you can't overload people. And you know, what I want to show people is that NFTs are not just, you know, there's so many big headlines that NFT is just about making money. It's just about doing these big collections. It's just about, I don't know, you know, there's also negative things around it. But what I'm trying to show is that, you know, NFTs is really for the creator and the creative economy. It's really a game changer of how it can unlock so much more creativity and that how art can now will now move from just a 2D flat kind of visual experience to you can have a multi-century, multi-dimensional experience. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? So for example, like I now use a lot of, um, before I would use just like a simple QR code that goes with the artwork that actually plays back the sound. Um, so that's accessing one dimension. But what I do is now is I use things like augmented reality um, and you know AI and now going into virtual reality to kind of make that a bit more of a different experience. And I'll give you an example. So yeah, in the in the, in Dubai, um, you know I've I've painted one of the world's largest augmented reality NFT mural. And so the mural, if you go into it, I mean it's literally twenty meters long by fifteen meters high. Like I don't know what that wow. means in American feet. But that's that's <laughs> big. It's really, large. it's really really large, right? And so if I'm like one meter sixty five, that kind of gives you an idea if it's fifteen meters, right? So it's really it's really very very large. And so you go to it, and then now you scan the QR code, and instead of just the voice coming, the whole wall pops out at you, literally like. And because it's through augmented reality, you are actually interacting with it live. And so you have the wall that is a static and then it's now fully immersive experience. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do with that is I want to show people and take people on the journey to be able to say like, this is really the new way to experience art. Like even the piece behind me, you'll be surprised if I just hold up um, you know my my camera if i activate it you'll actually be able to see a whole 3d animation coming out at you just from the piece behind me oh, wow. um which i don't know i mean i don't know we can maybe even try and see it a little bit yes oh yes let's, let's try if it works wait oops so like in here, you can see oh, that, right? Yeah. It's now going to see the artwork. And it's like, it's telling the story, but through a different that is, thing. Oh, that is so neat. Because I use a lot of augmented reality in my art is you can experience it right now from where you're sitting, um, from any screen. So if, for example, you go to my latest project, um, it's called the Alpha Bytes. Um, and it's spelled like the, and then alpha B Y T E S. And there's on the main page, you'll see a QR code, scan that QR code with your phone. So do it onto your laptop on your screen at home, and then it'll pop out into Instagram. Then what you can do is the filter will come up and you point it then at the artwork, which you'll see there, which says meta reversed. And the entire screen is going to pop out at you. So first the sound wave of the word meta reversed is going to come out, then my language, and then it decodes it into English saying meta reversed. So it decodes it from my language into English and you can experience it. And in fact, what would be really cool is you press the middle button, like you're taking a story and you can film it and you can move around the screen and that becomes a story. So I would love, love, love for yourself or the you know people watching this to go and try it. 
and then tag me at art by Amrita on Twitter yes. or even art dot by dot Amrita on link on um, Instagram. And, and then you'll be able to experience. And if you go to my website, there's quite a few of AR enabled artworks, which will then literally just pop out of your screen. And you can do this even on the go on your mobile or on your, on your computer, because this for me is really the way we are going to be interacting with everything in the future. Everything's gonna look static, but with a flick of a phone or with a Google glass or with an Apple glass, you'll be able to then see the whole world in a different way. It's incredible. I can't wait to try this. Now, the, these are the public displays. How does one contain that in their home if they want to collect those? I know that you have the, the picture on your wall, but then for people walking by, is it just, you know, now everybody has a smartphone, so just scan that QR code and be brought into that experience? So yeah, so that is the that's the experience side. And again, that's a very good question. So it's thou then, you know, creating the experience, but then how do you do it so that people then can own a piece of it, right? Nice. So obviously you can do through um, you know, NFT. So there's kind of, I'd say there's three types of asset class assets now in art, right? There's the physical art, which is behind you, behind me, for example. You have the NFT. Um, which is the digital format. So you could buy the NFT to it, or you can buy the physical to it. But there's a third one that's coming up and it's a new word, which, you know, it's kind of becoming well-known in the, in the, in the digital world called a physical. So it's digital. I'm sorry, say that again. <laughs> I know you're like, what? It's a physical. So it's a digital plus physical makes a physical. Oh, right. So it's like, for example, when and all that means is that when you buy the NFT, um, you also get a physical artwork with it. I see. So I it's, see. A, it's a combination because you don't always when you buy an NFT, it doesn't necessarily mean that it comes with a physical item and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of third one of being able to get um, both. And it's. it's yeah. Yeah. Is that a way for, for people to just, because we're all so very kind of tangible people. I mean, now with the metaverse, there's a lot of people living in these artificial realities, but still many of us do like the tangible. We like to feel tactile, you know, and, and to actually see something hanging on the wall. So is this to yeah. appease those who have maybe not yet reached that level of metaverse, uh, I, I guess? Mindset? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah, so 100%. And I think, you know, I think my latest collection, that's exactly what I try to do. So um, I've actually just, um, you know, just dropped, um, you know, a smaller but very significant collection for me. I, you know, one of the advantages of the metaverse or NFTs, I feel is that anything is possible, literally anything. The, I always say the only thing that stops you is your imagination. And so I thought, well, if anything is possible because of how much it unlocks through technology and creativity, I thought, why don't I just create my own language? So I did. So yeah. I, I took the alphabet, um, which is really, if you think about what the alphabet is, the alphabet is just a series of sets of symbols that we as human beings have just learned to just decode ourselves. Like we've understood the code and we know that A is a shape and that A is, means something to us. But if you have things like Arabic or as, like Chinese or whatever, you have different shapes, right? Yeah. And so what I did is I took the alphabet and I took my sound bites and then I combined them to make the alpha bites, which is also a play on a byte of the alpha b y t e which is a byte in terms of you know the, the 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 sort of techie term and so it all kind of falls together to complete what i what i'm trying to kind of uh, what i'm kind of entering right so a new yes. language so i then created the word um the first word that i chose from my alphabet um is the word meta reversed Okay, and the reason why I chose that word is because what is the metaverse? The metaverse is 
us going from a physical format into a digital format. So like, for example, even now, if we were having, so we're both here, we're both physical, but we're in the digital. Um, the only difference is, is if we were in the metaverse right now, is that our avatars would literally be sitting right next to each other and yes. we would be able to be interacting with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And that's right. really the future of how we will be um, being interviewed and how we will interact in the future in the metaverse. So, um, but what I was, so what I was doing, sorry, my, my Siri is listening to me. Um, so what I did is uh, very still techie. Working. Oh, <laughs> still working, still working. I'm just gonna put it on. Um, okay, so, um, so, and then, so what I did is I said to myself, okay, I, there was um, a recent uh, big art fair in Dubai, which is called Art Dubai and they have an NFT section. So what I wanted to show there was if you go to the NFT section, you're gonna to expect to see screens and NFTs. But what I wanted to do was create a physical artwork so that people could make that connection stronger. So I took a digital form that I'd created and bought it into the physical format. Hence why the word was meta reversed. And I created a sculpture in this word, in my new language. Oh, wow. So, oh, that is so, so, so I, I did say it's exactly so it's this kind of, you know, you, when you see it, you understand, because actually what had happened was, is um, I created the sculpture and it says meta reversed in my own alphabet. But what one of the other I, I'm, not, I'm sure you've heard of this, one of the other great advantages of NFTs is that it allows you to physically to fractionalize and you know something like an asset. So I'm sure you've heard how NFTs are fractionalizing homes or artwork. So you have like an artwork by Salvador Dali or you know Picasso and people can't afford to buy the whole thing. So what they do is they fractionalize it into small small pieces that everybody can buy and then everybody the whole community owns the piece of artwork, right? Oh interesting. Um, yes. Yes, so I think that's that's a kind of common use of it. Um, but and, and speaking, I, speaking of yeah. ownership, though, if I can ask you this, um, artwork uh, it ranges in many different price points. Your work has sold for a half million dollars. Um, when you look at fine art, not everybody can own something such as that or a Picasso. How attainable are these NFTs for the average person to own? Exactly that. So, you know, exactly. So th this is where it's been such a game changer because it allows people to have access to something they wouldn't be able to do. So, for example, just to continue this is that what I did is I had a sculpture and instead of studying, instead of selling that for half a million dollars, what I did is that it was made out of 145 slices of aluminium dipped in gold or silver or copper. And so I created 145 NFTs. And when you buy an NFT, you get a physical slice of the sculpture. So I physically fractionalized the artwork rather than, so everybody actually got a piece of the sculpture as well as the NFT. Oh, interesting. Why 145? Because to be fair, that's how many... <laughs> That's how many pieces there were when we designed oh, okay. it. I didn't know if there was a special uh, story that. behind that number. <laughs> yeah, no, it kind of did. There was the story because of how many, like, because I did it, the, the sculpture is made from like a sound wave concept. So some are higher, oh. some stacks were higher, some stacks were lower. And so just overall, so it's the kind of thing where it's actually, I think it's one of the world's first physically fractionalized NFT sculpture because it's, and so this is what I like to do is just say, okay, what is it? How can that be more relatable? Like instead of you buying 100, like one NFT and just getting a concept of that you own a bit of a artwork, but you can't physically touch it. I've said, okay, here's your NFT, but now you actually own a part of the actual artwork. It's like taking and the so, Mona Lisa and slicing it. <laughs> And giving exactly. a piece, to it. a piece exactly. of canvas so to somebody, but then it kind of still holds its own identity. That's right. Piece. Um, so yeah, exactly. that is, that is so interesting. Your artwork has been um, showcased in the public in the UAE. How about here in the United States? Have you picked a city? Have have people here been able to see your work? 
up close and personal in that same fashion? Um, it's definitely, I mean, it was definitely something that I'm, I'm aiming towards. It's because obviously with COVID and, and all of the kind of restrictions that have happened, um, you know, getting my pieces physically there is definitely some of my priority. I mean, you know, there's been so many amazing like events with blockchain weeks and Miami and New York. I mean, I was meant to speak at um, N NFC and NYT um, and then also in Miami. And then there was something recently in LA, but it's just been difficult, but that's one of the advantages of hopefully of, you know, of this kind of wider uh, net, I would say, through the through through the digital format is that a lot of people are getting to know about me in the US. In fact, um, there's a very large, um, in fact, one of the world's largest NFT collectors who lives in Miami. His name is Pablo Fraley. And he was he owns a lot of some of the biggest art collection from Beeple, you know, Blau, from Pack, from Rafik Anadol, some of the world's largest NFT. And I'm on the same kind of we're in the same community. And uh, Pablo just bought, bought 12 of my latest Alphabytes collection. Um, oh. And to quote him, he says it's the most comprehensive uh, collection to date because what I do with the Alphabytes is I showcase all the aspects of NFTs, um, you know, through also augmented reality and my uh, the Alphabytes is in the metaverse. And I've created digital wearables of that word. So, I mean, it's just really very extensive and I'm just trying to show people the power of what you can create if you if you do it well. Yes, and, and I've heard that uh, NFTs and collecting NFTs uh, amongst the Miami set has been uh, very popular. Are NFTs being sold in New York galleries and Los Angeles and Chicago and places like that? Are we seeing more and more of these popping up or... Or is it still a very new technology, a very new art? I think definitely, I think the, the States is definitely the leader, I would say, in all of this. Um, ah. and, and I think, you know, I mean, in terms of really, if you really, you know, you always say as an NFT artist, you really want to catch the market is catching the market in the US. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. You know, people are really into it they're really understanding it but nfts have also now i would say um and naturally so are now taking a slightly more move away from it just being about art but now mm. moving to the concept of community and utility uh -huh. so you hear a lot about these two words and so, um, you know, community, if I break it down, is around, you know, you've heard of the board, uh, you know, Ape Yacht Club, right? Yes, of course. Yes. So it's one of the, yeah, so it's one of the largest thing, largest NFT um, uh, collections out there. And where they've been super successful is having a community of where you want to be a part of that community. So NFTs, the NFTs stop becoming just about the art, but it also becomes a kind of proof of a, a visual proof that you are in the club, you know, like you're in part of the club, you are, you know, and that's how, that's why these kind of profile pictures, PFPs, then you can put that instead of putting it on your wall at home, who only people who come home see it, now your wall, because our new walls of our homes are the walls on our social media, mm. right? So mm -hmm. your Twitter, your LinkedIn, those are your real walls, right? Yes. But because we, we're not, we haven't made that mental shift. Actually, why show it just at home when you can show it to everybody? And so sure. if you were to think about the history of art, the history of art was always to have beautiful, like some, you know, that's where the wealthy and the rich, they show off their prowess that, that we are part of that club that can afford to own a Picasso. And those people who come to my home are able to understand that I'm part of that community. Right, and right. so to its core, that's what it is. And, and this is also where, you know, this is where it's also an important shift in, in terms of the paradigm.
Yes, indeed. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your upbringing, if we can, Amrita. You have lived in so many places. You were born and raised in Kenya. Uh, you are of a British citizen, Indian origin. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your childhood and how it's brought you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, I don't know if you've ever met an Indian, Kenyan, British person before. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's definitely a thing. And I'll give you a little bit of a two second history lesson. Um, you know, the Brits obviously went and colonized India first. Um, and India being the continent, large continent it is, they built the railways there. Then they went to East Africa. And again, Kenya specifically, a lot of Eastern Africa is a very important port to the rest of Africa because it's mainly a landlocked continent, right? And so Kenya was always very important from a trade perspective. So a lot of the Indians who had built the railway in India were taken to Kenya to build the railways that then would service the trade that would then come from the Silk Route into uh, the West, into the rest of Africa. And so that was my kind of, and so I'm third generation Indian, um, but of Ken, you know, like of Indian origin. So my bloodline is Indian, but you know, I'm, I, for me, I can consider myself very Kenyan in that sense because our family have been there for years. Yeah. And so they then, a lot of the Kenyan, the Indians stayed on and they became either business owners, but my family came up and stayed as the lawyers. So we were some of the lawyers of, the first lawyers of, um, of Kenya and um, and but my father so that's on my mother's side uh, but my father was an architect who worked uh, for the for the UN he actually studied in the US and MIT that's it oh so MIT studied, oh of yeah, course studied, yeah so he studied at MIT and you know he could have at the time he could have stayed and that was the time when you know that was when we were they were building all the big high rises in the US but to his core, he wanted to go back and take his skills back to Africa, which at the time was very unusual. It's it's not so unusual now, um, you know, but he wanted to go back and build. So he did a lot of things from an architectural perspective. So I always thought I was going to become an architect because I was very artistic when I was younger. Um, I, you know, I really, I, I, you know, I was also weirdly good at maths. And so, and so this is also the weird thing about me. It's just like that having that left brain and right brain activated, which yes. sometimes is always the case. Um, but then I kind of weirdly fell in love with economics at like 18. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> yeah, and, and so which companies did you work for when you were in that financial world? So some of the world's largest, like I worked for, I started my career off in Barclays in London. Um, and then I moved to Dubai, worked with HSBC. I worked in Switzerland with HSBC Private Bank and then with uh, Zurich Insurance. So always like, you know, you know, blue chip, top tier, you know, I was corporate through and through. Um, and so the change, I think, was something which a lot of people, even to this day, uh, they can't believe and it's only happened in the last three to four years. Right. And so mm -hmm. what I what I would say is. Um, I'd say the difference between, I would say, the centralized world and the decentralized world is, you know, in the centralized world, when I made the move from being a, a banker to an artist, you know, the kind of very old school art world was, was like, mm. Like that's, you know what I mean? That you're not, that, that you're not a thoroughbred. You didn't go to university and studied art, you know, you know, how can you come into this like later on? And, you know, it was, it was, you know, it's quite centralized. The artistic can be quite, you know, centralized, right? And right. so, and, but it was only, and so I was always a little bit, I would say shy to even call myself an artist at first. Mm -hmm. But then the minute I found NFTs, the NFT community and the decentralized world and the blockchain world and the crypto world just celebrated actually that. And they understood that having that background plus NFTs, and then I've now taught myself a lot in terms of technology. Like I'm always few, very few, I've always been very interested in the future and I love like different and new techs. And they were really like just a, it's a whole different vibe in terms of how welcoming you are, you're welcomed into the community. Um, and that, and this is what I love is that anything is possible. You know, whereas sometimes in this 
I say the more traditional world, there's still a lot of boundaries that you had to break through to get recognized. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So your travels have taken you from Kenya to Switzerland, Zimbabwe, Uganda, the UAE. How much of those cultural experiences would you say have impacted you and, and have impacted art by Amrita? Yeah, I mean, to my core, is who it's, it, it really fundamentally shapes who I am, right? And, and so I'm really, really lucky and blessed to have, you know, so many different um, you know, I would say just different experiences. And I think what it has taught me is just about different perspectives and different dimensions, right? And that you can always see things in a different way. And it's interesting to see, you know, again, I'm, I've become, I believe very, very strongly in the power of words, right? The power of words that we tell ourselves, the power of words that our parents told us, and the parent power of words that our parents, parents, parents told us, and then you can just literally go through generations. Yeah. And and you know, I do. I've like I'd say about five six years ago, I got very much into you know things like I'd say I became quite spiritual. Say whatever it take whatever you take from that, but maybe to its core is talking a lot about um, sort of you know neuro linguistic programming. So I talked like discussed a lot around how the neuro, which is the brain, the language, how we have programmed our brain and our minds to think in a certain way. And that is being, those things are very hardwired because of exactly like, what is the narrative that you tell yourself today? And, you know, what, like, just try it for the next 24 hours or for the next week and say, what do you say about yourself to other people? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what do you say to yourself? Because all of that has an impact on our personal reality, which then affects our personality. And we become so hardwired into a certain story about ourselves yes. or story about the way we live or story about the polity or story, whatever the case is. And what I try to show is that we really are the artists or the authors of our own life. And in this moment, in this right in this moment, should you wish to do so, you can change your whole life because you are the one who is the painter. You are the one who tells the story, not just to yourself, but to everybody else. Like I went from the story of me being a banker. Now I'm an artist and and that's my story. And this is I created that I consciously went out of my way to say, where my focus has gone, my energy is, my where your focus goes, your energy flows, right? So the more and more you tell that narrative, the more and more you create new neuro-linguistic pathways, not just in your own mind, but how people see you as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that we talked about just how you, you saw something that was so unique, innovative, that you trademarked it, but where, where exactly did the inspiration come from for Soundbite? What was that moment, that spark, where you said, wait a second, I want to take this and create it and make this? It's, a, it's, a, it's I think it's actually, you know, I've never thought about the answer this way, but it actually answers your other question in terms of like my background. So actually what had happened is, you know, my husband is, is Swiss and and so we were we were actually really in India and I was just taking some time off to to just, you know, to connect to who I was. And I, I wanted to make something sweet for him. I think it was his birthday or I don't know something. And I said, I said his name. So I wrote out his name in the sound wave. So I captured it. And then when I did it, I pressed kind of hard at the top. And then, you know, you're just drawing the lines like this, right? And so when I pressed hard at the top and I went down there, it started to look like a little head and a body. And obviously growing up in Kenya, you know, you always have the Maasai men. And this is a lot how they're abstractly portrayed as a bit of a big head oh, yes. and a body. And then you kind of just like, so then I, I started doing that. And I was like, actually, but Maasai men have got nothing to do with my, like the Maasai have got really nothing to do with my husband who's from Switzerland. Right. <laughs> and then that's when I thought, okay, actually, let me start to then combine the story with the the person, what I'm trying to do. And then then I was like, oh, wow, okay, that, that makes so much sense. Like, why yeah. don't I just do that? 
And then so I started my first collection actually with cities. So you can see I've got like Delhi or Dubai there. Yeah. And the reason why I started it with something so recognizable is because, you know, I wanted people, I because obviously this was again before NFTs, I wanted people to just visually kind of see that it was a sound wave and then, you know, it was the story. I mean, everybody can know the story of a city. So I think I just wanted to make it more recognizable. That is so fascinating. So obviously you, you saw the beauty of the sound wave itself, that there was something yeah. unique and beautiful about that. And it's about adjusting your perspective, right? Uh -huh. So like when people see things, like, like you see this, now you just see images, right? But now yes. you understood that it's a sound wave. And so like, I take a lot of inspiration from artists like Salvador Dali, who also did the same thing. It's just how you um, adjust your mind frame is how you then start to see different things, which is goes back to my point of being able to create new, new neuro-linguistic pathways to see a different reality, right? Because we get so stuck in the way. I mean, I'll give you a really classic example that happened to me. My name is Amrita. You spell it out, A-M-R-I-T-A. -A. I won't tell you how long old I am, but I've been staring at my name for a very long time <laughs> in my life. And it was only after I became an artist that if you take the letters of my word name and you redesign it, it spells out, I am art. How oh crazy my goodness. <laughs> crazy. You are correct. Yeah. Yeah, I am art. So now you're going to think about your name. What is that spelled? <laughs> but like, we used to play yeah. games, actually. We, we used to play games in school. If, if we broke down our names, what we could create with our names. And some of us, uh, we, we just couldn't get too creative. Yours, however, I think was written in the stars. There you go. And I think this is it. It's just that sometimes you've got to get out of your own way to understand what your calling really is. And I think we sometimes spend so much time chasing things that are not right for us because we may have been conditioned or coded in a way that we maybe is not right for us and it's learning to recode yourself. Yes, yes. Um, do you have a favorite piece that you've done thus far? Oh, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. Picking your favorite I child. I would, yeah, it is. I think, I think I would. It would be a toss up between the, um, the you know, the mural that I created, and um, the sculpture that I've just created. Because the sculpture, it really just signifies. You know, it's it's very significant in the sense that not only is it an NFT, not only is it a physically fractionalized sculpture, it's got augmented reality. You can go and see the sculpture in my land in Decentraland. I've created the coolest augmented reality wearable hoodies that like literally you scan it and your hoodie comes to life. Um, so it's a physical hoodie and, you know, and like, you know, and, and then you also have a digital hoodie, but then it's also, it's also a pass to my next project, which is my, um, you know, which is like, it's almost like the entry club to my private mm. members club which is going to be called the Meta Maison, which is like the house of, of art or meta for me. Because, you know, if you think about, if you think about it, like the fashion world has been able to create a house of Dior or house of Gucci, there's yes. fashion houses. But up until NFTs, you couldn't really scale up an artist, right? Could you? Because it's like, how much can one artist do? But with NFTs is you can scale up an artist. So I'm creating my first art house, NFT art house, with me as the creative director. And then being able to then create like, like something like um, a fashion house where I create my own collections, but I house other upcoming artists. And then I can work with different brands, um, very different you know, celebrities and people who are now coming and saying, we want an NFT collection, what can be our strategy and how I can guide them through that process. That is so interesting. And do you, so, so being the artistic director and, and kind of housing other people, do you collaborate ever with other artists on your NFT projects? 
I mean, this... I kind of haven't got to it now, but this is definitely something that, you know, this is where the next steps will be, right? Is just being able to, and my art lends itself so much to collaboration. You know, it's, yeah. imagine my sound bites with, X, you know, like another artist, and then, you know, you can kind of create it, uh, you know, together. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, and I think that the NFT space is, um, is, is ripe for collaboration because you can then cross pollinate different communities and you can get a much wider reach that way. What about uh, issuing NFTs in places with strict crypto regulation, so uh, such as the China's NFT market? So I think um, where it kind of hopefully is is I think it's I think it's kind of working with what you've got available to you in terms of the the, the regulations. Um, I think having things like being able to pay with fiat money as well as you know crypto i think you have to be able to do both um and i think this is it it's like i lost my last collection i wrote the smart contract myself but you can also get into clever payment methods right so people can also pay in fiat as well as in crypto and i don't think that's just also a regulation thing i think it's also people you know, just like people want tangible things, they're still struggling with this concept of buying crypto, but they maybe still want to buy an NFT. And mm -hmm. so there's a difference between, I don't know if you've heard the difference between a custodial wallet and a non-custodial wallet, but there's a way in which you can buy an NFT through fiat. Um, and, and I think being able to have those options, especially if you're trying to bring I would say the masses into the NFT space is what's very important. And that's where I also uh, believe that there's going to be a, a lot of um, mass adoption through that, that, through that channel. So interesting. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? You know, the way you're, yeah. you're building something so new and innovative, and I can only imagine that really it's going to take off from here. So, so in 10 years, what, what do you think? Where do you see yourself? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, I see myself moving seamlessly um, between the physical and digital world. I see everybody else doing the same. And I see the fact that we will have multiple avatars and personalities. I think, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg's, um, you know, uh, video that he put out about the meta, you know, you know, he, they're creating a new metaverse, um, having, you will have your, you know, how you have so many different personalities, you'll be able to express yourself like, you know, you'll have your corporate you, you know, just how you have you like you have a LinkedIn profile, a Twitter profile, a, you have a different vibe for each one of those. Now imagine instead of it just being a profile, it's you as an avatar. So today I want to wake up and be a unicorn who wears um, you know, um, you know, like, um, you know, who wears a beret on the hat and like, is just a belly, you know, belly dancer. Like if I want to be that, I can be that. Right. And so, yeah. you know, and if I wanted to have like, um, you know, a Lego arm or whatever the case is, I can do whatever I want. Right. So, so this is it. So you, you will be able to express yourself very creatively, but I also do think that, and in fact, I think it's already kind of happened, but I've been saying this for a while is that, you know, it's a bit like, you could kind of live forever also. So your avatar, in fact, they've just done it in Somnian space, is that you, your avatar, you like, you can, you'd like say physically you pass away, right? But you can actually have an avatar which is augmented, you no, know, artificial intelligence, which teaches it like, it acts exactly like you. It's just like a digital twin of you, right? So it thinks like you because you've been training it, right? So it's watches yeah. you doing what you do. And then it becomes a digital twin of you. And then what happens is that then the physical you passes away. And then, you know, like later on, the, the digital person is still available and your parent, your kids grow up and they want advice from mom and mom oh gives God. you advice like mom's around because <laughs> AI and you can. Do, do you think people are emotionally ready for that? <laughs> I think I think not everybody, and I think it definitely does has a lot of socio-political 
um, you know, things. So I don't want to overbrain you, but it brings that it happening. bubbles up many emotions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It does. And I mean, even in a small little way, like with my art, um, you could actually create a piece because it talks, the art talks, right? In my situation, it talks right, with the sound bites. So you could actually create a piece of art from me where I hold on to it. And if you ever wanted to release it to your child at 18, if you weren't there or your grandchildren or whatever the case is, this, this NFT can arrive in their wallet, you scan it and you've got the entire augmented reality of your loved one, you know, expressing themselves to to you That's and you can still do that you know so like even the pieces that I've created for personalized is that you know you know I had one where a guy lived in Dubai and his mother lived in the U.S. and like whenever she misses her son she just does the artwork and the artwork is him telling her all the stuff why he loves about her all through the sound bite. Oh. That's so, so touching. It's different, thank you. It's just a different medium of, and it's how to show that you can use art in just more ways than I think we're using it today. Pro- profound and quite useful ways, very useful ways that, that touch more than just your um, aesthetic, your sensibilities of what you think is attractive or interesting, but that actually have an impact on your life. And exactly. And talking about that is that's where utility comes in. Mm -hmm. So this is a big buzzword in the NFT world is what does that artwork now give you access to? So does it give you access to an emotional message? Does it give you access to a private members club? Does it give you access to a concert or a ticket to go and see your favorite artist? Does it give you access to a VIP event that you can only go to if you have that NFT? And so, for example, even like the people who bought my 145, I call them bite, the bite club. Um, I like the bite bite club. (laughs) I like the bite club. You know, they only, only if you have my NFT, can you go to some of the VIP events that I hold that you'll have access to maybe some physical artwork that you wouldn't necessarily have if you, you didn't have my NFT. So these are certain things is that where now um, collectors are looking at what other utility does the art have? Indeed, indeed. And at the end of this, and I know you've got art to create, so I won't keep you much longer than maybe about five more minutes, if I may, Amrita, but I would love to direct everybody to where they can find out more information about you. But before we do that, I just have a few quick fire questions um, with just about five minutes left and just answer them as uh, best you possibly can. I'm going to start with this first one. Uh, What was your biggest hobby when you were a child? Actually, it was obviously art. But I love dancing. So I've done ballet, um, Highland and Scottish dancing. So I was always dancing. After my own heart, I was a ballet dancer myself. Um, And if you could live absolutely anywhere on this planet, where would it be? I would have to say Dubai, but, you know, Kenya and Switzerland and India, like a bit of all the places where I live today. But I'd love to live once. I'd love to live once in New York and once in L.A., I'd say as well. Yes, yes. Um, who is your favorite artist? Do you have a favorite artist? I think, I think Salvador Dali for me is one of the most impactful artists for me. Okay. Um, did you ever have a mentor, whether in business or in art? Mentors are the most important things, but always go to the expert in their field. Don't go to just your best friends or your family because they're not always the best people. Go to the experts in your field to get the yes. right advice. Yeah. Indeed. Um, and what do you think is uh, the most interesting thing that you've come across in recent days, weeks, whether it's something that you read, something that you've discovered? So it's a really cute little story. Um, I have yesterday, I was, it was Easter and we were with our friends. And, um, you know, is a set, like I find that, you know, children between the ages of six and 12 understand me the most because they understand nfts the most they are so they're already there and so i find my children's friends are really you know they are the most um i would say activated when they see me and this little boy he's now my collector he's got a, one of my 145 bytes and he says that 
his quote and he made the quote and I put it on my Instagram for him. And we said, art is not just about painting and drawing. Art is also about what you can invent. And it's by Sasha, um, I, I always forget his surname, but Sasha, you know, you know who I'm talking about. And this is a shout out to him as well. Oh, that's wonderful. All right. Uh, try to describe yourself in three words if you can. So, oh, three words. That's pretty hard. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I would say definitely extrovert. Um, definitely, um, I'd say creative. And definitely, I'd like to think I'm generous in heart and spirit as well as everything else. But Those are all lovely qualities and characteristics. I want to thank you so much, Amrita, for joining us. And so finally, uh, for people who are interested in learning more about you, uh, where can they find you? So you can find me on Twitter at Art by Amrita, um, Instagram at art.by.amrita, and LinkedIn at Amrita Seti. And then from there, you'll find your way. Wonderful. And Rita Seti, I want to thank you again so much for joining us. This has been a true pleasure. And that is going to do it for us on this episode of Blockchain All-Stars. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. <music>